So I'm going to use the next section because the last section there were so many notes in there it was starting to run really slow. So I know I already did undetermined coefficients before. So I'll just write the rest of the notes in uh, this section here. Port Z. Or yeah, port Z. So <coughs> we're going to compute a Taylor series. So we'll write down the Taylor series formula. So it's going to be of f of x at x equals a. So we have summation k equals 0 to infinity f k derivative at a divided by k factorial x minus a to the k. So that should be familiar right there. That's the Taylor series. <coughs> So let's compute t0 of x for sine x. So see what you're made of. Don't just read off your cheat sheet. You can read off your cheat sheet, but that's to check, not to compute it. So I want you to actually compute this out. And I'll give you five minutes for this. If you got any extra time at the end, get the radius and interval of convergence, if you have extra time. Yeah, the kth derivative, exactly. Um, once you know the first four derivatives, you hopefully will start seeing the pattern form and then evaluate those derivatives at zero.
f of x is just sine x. So when you're taking, oh, yeah, yeah. when you're on the, so look at zero, one. Yeah, yeah but what I'm saying is like, I and then you do end up multiplying by zero. Yeah, so you end up multiplying by zero. So you know, all your zeros are all. Right, right, right. No. Yeah. Because the cosine of zero is not zero. But then you multiply by Corbett. You don't do that. <laughs> Because your f of one uh, parentheses zero, that's with respect to a, not x. So your x is zero. You're centered at zero, but your x can still change after that. So you should end up with an alternating series that uses every other term. All right, any questions? Every other term was zero, as was being mentioned, and it's the even terms that don't show up. So <clears throat> the way we fix that, if we don't want to change, if we want to let k go 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, we have to adjust it so we only hit the odds. So we do 2k plus 1, gets all the odds. You could do 2k minus 1, but then you have a problem when k is 0, you'd have negative 1 which is definitely going to mess up. You should not have a negative power of x anywhere. It's supposed to be a polynomial. All right, so that is sine. How would I find the Taylor series for cosine? I could do the same way. I could take another five minute break while you guys work hard. What's a faster way to do it? Way less work for you. How is cosine related to sine? That. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Some calc one stuff. So I'm just going to take what's above that summation and sub sub it in for sine. So everything that's not x is constant. So I can distribute the derivative across the sum, which means I just I'm going to change the order with the derivative and the summation. So that'll be the sum rule. And then I can push it past all the constants, which is anything that does not have an x in it. So doing both of those at the same time. So the negative one of the k and the 2k plus 1 factorial are constant. And we're just going to now take the derivative of x to the 2k plus 1. So take this derivative, simplify it as much as you can, and then that's what we're going to use for cosine. And I'll do my best to write down e to the x. So we don't have to compute it. <clears throat> Is that e to the x right? Any of you remember your Taylor series? I don't have my calc book with me. Is it on there? Probably. It's probably more likely in your calculus cheat sheet. Yeah. Taylor series? Yep. On the, the bottom, in the middle. Bottom. Middle, all right. Oh no, I think you're missing this one. Oh, the one that we need? Yeah, I guess I don't have that one. Yep, you're missing it. Well, the derivatives of e to the x are all the same. So it should just be the x to the k over k factorial term. Yeah, all the derivatives will be z When you plug in 0, you'll get 1 out of all the derivatives. So, yeah, I think that'll be right.
All right, so any questions on that uh, derivative? Basically just lowering the power by one and then you're multiplying by 2k plus one which just drops your factorial down one. And that's pretty much it. Not much else going on. All right, so we got sine, the expansion for sine, the expansion for cosine, expansion for e to the x. I'm gonna write out the first few terms. I'll use blue here. <coughs> So when k is 0, we have x, k is 1, we have a negative x squared over 3 factorial. Ooh, I've already messed up. Negative x cubed. Yeah. And we have x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the seventh over seven factorial plus dot dot dot. So that sine cosine is one minus x squared over two factorial plus x to the fourth over four factorial plus x to the sixth, which should be minus x to the sixth over six factorial plus dot dot dot. <coughs> All right, e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial, x cubed over 3 factorial, plus dot dot dot. That's a good question. So there's the remainder. So <clears throat> if you're using a computer or if you're in real life, you can't go to forever. So I can write dot, 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 but we can't actually compute forever. So how do we know how far to compute to get a reasonable number? So that's what's called the error or the remainder. Uh, So let's look at the remainder. So the remainder is basically the tail. So if we read out a Taylor series summation, how did I write it? I don't want to write all that stuff. Let's let uh, CK equal FK at A over K factorial. So I'm just going to shortcut all that stuff to CK. So we're going to look at the first bunch of terms. So we'll go from zero to big N, and we got CK X minus A to the K plus, now we're gonna start at N plus one and go to infinity. So this big N could be any number. Uh, the way I wrote these out, it was probably somewhere around four or so. I wrote the first four terms and then wrote the last, the rest of the terms as dot, dot, dot. So this right here is what we call the remainder. I think your book uses lowercase n, so I'll just use a lowercase n as well. This is R sub n is going to be this remainder that I wrote down. Is all this a specific section in the book? Uh, 
Uh, I'm reading out of my notes out of 37, so it's probably in 37 somewhere. It's also in a calculus book, but we skipped over this. Uh, but it's basically how to figure out how far to go uh, to get the accuracy that you want. <clears throat> All right, there is a way uh, for a specific x value. So Rn of x can be estimated. So I want to put a specific x value in, so I'm not just going to write of x, I'll write of x naught. So we're actually going to fix an x value. So Rn of x naught is going to equal, so it's the nth plus first derivative is the one you use. Now you can't just plug in a right there, unfortunately. So that's the tricky part. And you get x minus uh, x naught to the n plus one power over n plus one factorial. So it's basically the first term that would show up in the remainder. The only difference is I'm not going to put, before we had x naught, I'm not gonna put x naught in there. I'm going to put capital X in. Where capital X is some number. Oh, actually you already made a mistake. All right, so we don't actually have to have a fixed X naught. So we're going to estimate this uh, term, right, or all the rest of the terms. Uh, now this x, this capital X, is some number between uh, the x that you inputted and x not the number you're centered at. So if you think of your number line, you're centered at x not. You can go out a certain distance. You better be inside your interval of convergence. But x could be uh, maybe a little bit bigger than x naught, or x could be a little bit smaller than x naught. You don't know necessarily what side it's on unless you know what x naught is and what your x value is. But the idea is big X, or capital X, comes from somewhere in between x and x naught. Uh, now finding it's a different story. So what you can do is you can basically pick the number between x and x naught that gives you the largest value. And that's a way you can get an upper estimate for your remainder terms. So we're picking x such that if n plus one of x is maximized. Remember how to maximize a function? Zero. Take the derivative, set it equal to zero. What is the input variable for this function? Okay. It's capital X. Oh, yeah. <coughs> so to maximize, You're going to take DD capital X which is just F n plus 2 of big X and set it equal to 0. So you can solve for big X that way. doesn't necessarily mean it's easy just because you have the 35th derivative equals 0 doesn't mean it's easy to solve for X. It might be miserable. Uh, certainly for functions e to the X it's pretty easy to do. Uh, the sine and cosine is not that hard to do. All right, let's go ahead. We expanded out sine, so we may as well figure out our uh, worst case remainder, 
we would get from the expansion we're using right here. So if we look at this, things are a little bit weird because we're going 2k plus 1 instead of just k. So it's in a slightly weird form. So I'm just going to rewrite this sine x expansion and we're going to compute the remainder for sine. need to get the remainder here. <coughs> so the question is what subscript should I put in? It's tempting to write 8. It's also tempting. I think we want to I'm going to use 8. I think will be the right number. Uh, regardless though, Yeah, I somehow switched to evens. That's not good. All right, so the remainder can be estimated by the first term that shows up by maximizing that. So let's look at the remainder. So what the next term would look like is x to the ninth over 9 factorial. That's what the next term would be. Uh, but we have to switch things up a little bit. So let's think about what this would look like in terms of the Taylor series formula for the term. So we've got the k factor on the bottom, f. K uh, at zero, x to the k, and these would all be nine. So this is the ninth derivative at zero, x to the ninth over nine factorial. That would be the next term that shows up, the one I didn't write. So any questions about why that would be that term that would go next right there? So just following in the pattern, that's the next term. The difference is, <coughs> we're not going to use 0. This is where we put capital X in. So I want to find the biggest capital X, or the, the capital X that makes this the biggest value possible. X to the ninth and 9 factorial, those aren't really going to affect that. It's really just F ninth derivative evaluated at capital X. Maximize f9 of x by setting f 10th derivative of capital X equal to 0. So I'm setting the next derivative equal to 0. All right, what is the 10th derivative of sine? Probably We're not going to work with probably today. So what I just did, I know four derivatives don't do anything. So I basically stripped out eight derivatives. So one cycle of four, another cycle of four. So this is modular arithmetic right here. And now, second derivative is negative sign. Of course, I should be using capital X. All right, so that means sine x equals zero. What 
Now there's infinite solutions right here, but certainly zero is a solution, pi is a solution, negative pi is a solution. So it could be, oh, I don't want to use K, that's already in use. Let's go with M pi. And I have to pick for it certain, there's one integer value of M is probably zero. That's gonna make this work. All right, so what is the other stipulation on capital X? It has to be between X and X naught. Well, we uh, are centered at zero, so why don't we just go with zero? That's definitely going to be between zero and any other number. So we're going to go with zero here. All right, so X capital X equals zero. So what is the maximized value? We'll find that now. What is the control thing upside down there? Pi? Oh, it's a pi. Yeah. Uh, so the maximized value is F ninth derivative of capital X, which is that eighth derivative was sine, the ninth derivative will be cosine. So it's cosine of capital X, and our capital X was zero, so that's one. Now that was a whole lot of work. You probably could have told me the maximum value of cosine previously without knowing any calculus, but this is just in general what you have to do. If it was a more complicated, like a polynomial, you'd have to take derivative set equal to zero and do the actual work. <coughs> if it's an easy trig function, you may already know the maximum. All right, so we're going to take that value back up. So we just got f ninth derivative of x was 1. So it's 1 x to the ninth over 9 factorial. So what this means is the remainder, the rest of the terms, can be no bigger than this number right here, if you plug in x in. So this gives you an upper bound on the rest of the terms. So one thing you can tell already is that uh, this isn't just this is R eight. If x is really big, this number gets huge, right? X to the ninth over nine factorial. When x is small, it's not that's a pretty small number, but when x is big, that starts to get very large very quickly. Nine factorial is a big number, but it's a constant. So eventually, when x is big enough, x to the ninth is going to crush that nine factorial. So what that means is if you're going to use x's maybe uh, close to 9 or 10 or bigger numbers, what you need to do is go way further out than 8. So that's what this tells you. How far out you're going to go with x, you're going to need to choose, uh, you're going to need to expand way further out. That's what this tells us right here. So if I need to, ac if I need to be within like one-tenth of the actual value, and if my x is going to be big, like 100, this is nowhere near 1 tenth if x is 100. This is way bigger. So it depends on how far away from your centered value you are and uh, how many terms you've expanded to. And the further you go away from your center value, the more terms you need. And this is how you estimate it. Let's uh, take... Let's see... I don't know it's going to be too much work, but uh, there's an alternative way to see your Taylor series converge. Taylor series converges when lim k approaches infinity, rk of x equals zero. So it's going to converge if if you kept going at bigger and bigger k's, if that remainder term gets smaller and smaller and goes to zero. That's uh, an alternative way to look at conversions, is if that's happening. I know I'm writing up and down and up and down. That's 
Probably not helpful. Alright, so that's a lot deeper look at Taylor series than you probably saw before. So if you're actually using Taylor series to estimate, you do need to know how accurate your estimate is. You can always go more terms than you need, that's totally fine, you'll get more accuracy than you need, but you want to make sure you go at least as far as the accuracy that you're going to require. So I need to pick a good, a problem that has good solutions. Let's do what I want to do next. So this, <coughs> the what I'm about to show you is not in the textbook, or at least I didn't see it in the textbook. It's not really my method, but I don't have another name to put up here right now. So what we're going to do is solve. Y prime plus 3y prime, or y double prime plus 3y prime plus 2y equals 4. This is an alternative way to solve with the series. Alright, so first of all, are the coefficient functions analytic? Do they have nice power series? Yeah, these are the nicest functions you get. They're constants. So they definitely have a Taylor series expansion. And in fact, I already wrote the Taylor series expansion out. The rest of the terms are zero. So these definitely have nice Taylor series. All right, so the theorem I showed you says there is a Taylor series solution. So there exists. Taylor series solution. I know what, this one's going to be way too hard. I'm going to pick one with an easier answer. I think I better go degree one. How about y prime equals y? All right, so the solution definitely will be analytic. So y equals, how do I want to write this? I'm going to write the easiest way possible. We'll go ck um, x to the k. equals zero to infinity. All right, <coughs> so from here, uh, I want to plug this in. So all I need to do is get y prime. So I'm going to take derivative of y. So that's k c k x to the k minus one. And I'm going to start this series at one. So that's y prime. Now I'm going to plug in. Alternatively, I could write as y prime minus y equals zero. That might be more uh, in the form that we're used to more recently. So let's solve it that way, y prime minus y. Yeah, uh, you can actually have it at zero, but then your uh, initial bunch of terms will be zero because you have like a k times k minus one times k minus two so it'll it'll auto zero out those terms anyways all 
size. You got Y prime, K equals one to infinity. Minus some um, CKX to the K, K equals zero to infinity, equals zero. All right, what we're gonna do is match coefficients. We're gonna be matching coefficients here. So my initial term on the left is K C1, oops, one C1, wow. Uh, X to the zero plus K is two. We have two C2 X plus three C3 X squared plus four C4 X to the fourth plus I'll go dot 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 now. So that's just the first few terms written out. And I'm going to expand the second one out until I hit x to the fourth again. So now the second sum is c0 x to the 0 plus c1x plus c2x squared plus c3x cubed plus c4x to the fourth plus dot 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 equals zero. All right, so any questions about what I'm doing? I'm really just using that theorem, plugging back in. So I'm gonna go uh, group up similar terms. So my constant terms, I have a C1 and a C0. I think I need an initial condition also. Yeah, I'll need to know one of these values, so let's put a condition in. Four C four X to the fourth could be four C four X to the fourth. Oh that guy. In that case, I don't need that term. Let's take y of 0 to equal 1. Oh, that's too lame. y of 0 equals 2. Let's do that. All right. So when y of 0 equals 2, what does that, which constant does that let me get? So I'm going to plug in 0 into my initial y right here. So we get summation. C k zero to the k equals zero to infinity. So what is the only term I get out of here? Yeah. So we only get it's probably it's probably bad to write zero to the k because it's not always zero. It's only zero when k is not zero. Uh, so I get c zero. So that means two equals c zero right there. So my initial coefficient is c zero. So now I'm going to group up uh, terms. Actually, let's write that somewhere else. I want to do a little more algebra here. C0 is 2. Constants, I have C1 plus C0. Linear terms, 2, C2 plus C1, x. Quadratic terms, 3, C3 plus C2 x squared plus 4c4 plus c3 x cubed. I didn't write any more terms, so that's as far as we're going to go. All right, so c1 plus c0 equals 0. How did I know that? You can get it right from the line above, but what about that equation right above tells me C1 plus C0 equals 0? So yeah, C1 plus C0 is the only constant term on the left. What's the constant term on the right? 0, so the better match. So that means C1 plus C0 has to equal 0. Now I'm going to go to the x term. So there's 2c2 plus c1. What is the coefficient for the x term on the right side? 
zero. So I'll fill in the missing terms. So we got no x's, x squared, x cubed. So I'm matching coefficients right now. So the original of the e was y prime minus y equals zero. And uh, you have the sum of the y prime minus the sum. Oh no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, all the C's on the right should be negatives, which is actually easy for me to change. So that means all the second terms are subtracted. There we go. Alright, so the next pair of terms are C th 3C3 minus C2 equals 0 and then 4C4 minus C3 equals 0. Alright, so plug in 2 for C0. So C1 equals 2 and now we have 2C2 equals C1 which is 2. So C2 equals 1. So figure out the other two C values right now. All right, so we got two, two, one, one third, one twelfth. So now we can write our y. At least we'll wait till tomorrow to write that.